So if you're looking to have a hanging, heaping helping of hugely hypertrophied hamstrings, you, my friend, clicked on the right video. In this video, I'm gonna break down volume, anatomy, sets, reps, exercises, execution, everything you need to put some meat on the back of your legs. Turn around, look down there. Yeah, you could probably use some, couldn't you? So let's start with anatomy. Two main functions, hip extension and knee flexion. So hip extension is gonna be mostly hinging type of movements. So deadlifts, good mornings, back extensions, that kind of thing. Whereas knee flexion is gonna be your leg curling type of stuff. So it could be on a machine, could be on a ball, lots of different options here, which we'll get into a little bit later. Now, in terms of anatomy, without getting too deep into it, the only thing you really have to know is that the short head of the biceps femoris does not cross the hip. So in terms of hip extension, it's not gonna be worked at all. So anyone who says, oh, you can just do good mornings and do deadlifts and you'll get you know, maximum hamstrings, they're not quite right. That being said, the short head is pretty small, so like, eh. So first, let's go into the exercises, starting with the hinge variations. Now, any kind of deadlift is going to be working the hamstrings, but you sort of have to ask at what cost, because you're working a lot of other muscles as well. So if you're doing conventional deadlifts, yes, your hamstrings can absolutely grow from that, or even like a sumo style, a sumo stands, that can also work the hamstrings, but it's probably not gonna be optimal just from a pure hypertrophy standpoint. You're getting a lot of fatigue, a lot of load, uh, a lot of other muscles that are kicking in, and the hamstrings, yeah, they're working, but you could sort of isolate them and bias them a little bit more with something like a Romanian deadlift. So if you just want bigger hamstrings, I would go RDL over conventional deadlift every single time. It's just a better movement for that purpose. And I also think it's important to do it the correct way. It's not just doing a deadlift that is floating. You have to do it in the correct way to get the most out of it. So if you deadlift the weight down and you pause above the floor and you let the knees go forward, well, now you're using the quads to drive the weight up. What you want to do is you can have a slight bend in the knees. That's completely fine but you wanna keep the tension on the hamstring. So when I'm coaching this movement, I'm cueing, push the hips back, 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 back. You're not focusing on lowering the weight down. You really wanna focus on loading the hamstrings through the hips, pushing them back, and then keeping the tension off of the quads and then off of the erectors as well. There's a lot of other muscles that can come into play when the weight gets too heavy. If you're not feeling a stretch on the hamstrings every single rep, you're not really targeting them to the maximum extent possible. And you might have to humble yourself with the weight that you use if you've been doing them in a more loose, cheated style before. This is something I've personally encountered. I've used 150 kilos, 160, 170 kilos for Romanian deadlifts. But looking back, it was a lot of spinal erector, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a lot of spinal erector. You can see the knees coming forward a little bit in the bottom position. And so it's one of those movements that it's very, very easy to take tension off of the area that you want to target. And so you're getting less stimulus and also a lot more fatigue. And with these spinal loading movements, you do want to try to minimize the fatigue and maximize the stimulus whenever you can. This is something I've realized and I've made this mistake many times in the past. And if you want to deadlift the most weight, Get your quads involved, get your erectors involved, get your scapula involved. You see a lot of really, really good deadlifters. They protract their scapula in the bottom position and then they retract it at the top. And this is just to get more muscle involved and to move more weight. But that doesn't mean you're gonna get any bigger hamstrings at all because it's targeting a different area. You can also do a stiff-legged deadlift uh, the distinction here, and this is something not everyone agrees on, I have RDL being hamstring focused, floating during the set, and then stiff like a deadlift, you pause on the floor between reps. I often do them from a deficit as well. And both are good movements. If I had to choose one, I would definitely choose the RDL specifically for hamstring hypertrophy, but stiff like a deadlifts are definitely viable as well. Again, you're limiting the load, you're taking the quads more or less out of it, uh, and thus you're getting more hamstrings from less weight. 
You can also do snatch grip deadlifts, uh, you know, deficit deadlifts, lots of options here. But again, I would say purely from a hypertrophy standpoint for the hamstrings, stiff legged deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, those are the way to go. Another great hinging option is the good morning. Good morning, goddammit. So this is when the bar is actually on your back, sort of like in a high bar or maybe a low bar squat position. And it's a very, very similar movement to the RDL. It's just that you're not going to be able to use as much weight. You can't use the rear delts, the lats, the long head of the triceps to keep that bar closed. It's sort of fixed in position, and therefore you just won't be able to use as much weight. Most people are probably going to be around half, maybe a little bit more, compared to the Romanian deadlift. And this is also a good movement. Very, very similar cues. Sit the hips back, keep the tension on the hamstrings and then drive the heels through the floor in order to return to the starting position. Excellent movement here. I would set it up in a power rack for sure, just because if you fail a Romanian deadlift, no big deal. You know, you just, you drop the weight. If you fail a good morning, a little bit riskier. I personally find that a good morning is a little bit more core and lower back and spinal erector and, you know, bracing, probably because, again, you can't keep the bar close. Therefore, it's going to be taxing the midsection muscles a little bit differently. It also does depend on the bar that you use. If you use, you know, a cambered bar or a safety squat bar or some other type of bar, that can change exactly where the resistance is going to be and thus the loading that you can use and also where the tension is going to be. Is it going to be in the hips? Is it going to be in the hamstrings? Is it going to be in the glutes? Is it going to be in the erectors, etc.? So it does change a little bit based on how you do it and the bar that you use. Next up, we have back extensions, phenomenal movement, very, very safe. You can do them with the bar on the ground or you can put it uh, on your back. Both very, very safe. If you fail, you know, you just you go down in the bottom position where there's not that much tension anyway. <laughs> can you feel the tension? There's tension there, but you can just sort of chill there and you can just drop the bar off. So this is a, a much safer movement compared to the good morning overall and uh, really, really good for the hamstrings, I would take a slower tempo, really feel the hamstrings lengthen on the way down, uh, and then drive your hips into the pad to finish the movement. Uh, I wouldn't arch back a ton. You want to keep the movement in the hips as much as possible. And if possible, I would put the bar on your back, not on your neck, but like on, on your upper traps. It feels fine in the bottom position. Just, you know, use your hands to keep it on you. And I would go with this over the bar on the ground in most cases, just because you can get a lot more range of motion. Feels better. You can really lengthen out those hamstrings. And we do know that length and position is very, very important for growth. And that's about it for hinges. So stiff like a deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, back extensions, and good mornings. Those are sort of the four horsemen of hinging hamstring hypertrophy. You do, however, also want to have some curling movements, at least one in your program. This could be a machine, this could be with a ball, but you want something to target that short head. And this is also good because unlike the hinges, you're not going to be working the lower back. And often the lower back in terms of recovery is the limiting factor anyway. So this can be a good way to just get in some extra easy to recover from volume. First up, Nordic hamstring curls. These are brutally difficult. One of the more challenging exercises, very, very few people can do a full rep where they're controlling it all the way down to the bottom, you know, pausing under control and then going back up. I know knees over toes guy can do them. I cannot, uh, I can barely get halfway down before my body's like, nope, not happening. Obviously the lighter in body weight you are, the easier this is. But regardless, if you can do full range of motion reps with this, you are a fucking badass. I mean, your ass is good because you can use your, you can hinge with the, anyway. You can also do curls on a, not a BOSU ball, a Swiss ball, one of those big blue balls uh, that you see in the gym. Put your feet on there, keep your hips up, back on the ground, do a bunch of reps there, just curling the bar, the ball towards you. Those are absolutely phenomenal. Do them for higher reps, you know, 20 or 30 reps. This is nice because you're working the knee flexion but you're also working the hip extension isometrically by keeping your hips in the air. So this is really, really good for runners, I found, uh, just because it teaches you to curl the knee, to flex the knee while the hips are held high, which is pretty much what happens during a running stride. So really, really good movement for runners here. If you can do them on one leg, 
you are a savage. You can also do them with a TRX or with rings. You just put your feet in them and then, you know, you can curl it towards you that way. You can also do them gliding on the floor. So you put something slidey under your feet and then you just curl your feet towards you. Again, you're working uh, that hip extension and then also the knee flexion as well. These are brutal, really underrated. You don't see them that often, but they are really, really, really good movements. And for these movements, you can arch your lower back when your knees are straight in order to get more of a stretch. And then you can posteriorly pelvic tilt at the contraction to get more of a contraction. So this takes a little bit of practice, uh, but you'll find that you get a better stretch and then also a better contraction by altering your hip position during the set. And this can be a way to get more out of less weight, especially when you are more advanced. And the same holds true for machine curls. So seated curls, lying curls, standing curls, they're all good. They shift the tension and the difficulty of the movement at various points, whether it's the contracted position or the lengthened position. I would say in doubt, use a seated machine just because you're gonna have a more lengthened overload. There was actually one study where it found that the seated performed better than the lying curl, likely because it's just training at longer muscle lengths, which is often a good idea. Keep in mind, however, if you're doing RDLs, good mornings, back extensions in your program, you're already working the lengthened position anyway, sort of by definition, assuming you're doing them correctly. And so you might want to use a lying leg curl just to complement. How you doing? I'm okay. What? Those movements. So always look at your program as a whole, not just a study that says this is better than this. It's not just that, it's how everything works together in the context of your program. You can also do dumbbell curls. I don't see these very often either, probably because they're really, really annoying to set up, but you can lie on a bench and then put your feet into a dumbbell and then curl the dumbbell that way. This is another good lengthened overload. You can see in this video, I'm not going all the way up because there's no tension in the top position because gravity is going straight down. And so I'm keeping the tension sort of in that bottom position. And this might look like partial range of motion, and it is, but this is a lot of tension and I'm keeping the tension on the muscle where there's actually going to be tension. In contrast, if you're hanging from a pull-up bar or dip bar or something else, and you are curling the dumbbell up that way, there's gonna be the most tension in the top position and no tension in the bottom position. So again, look at your program as a whole and think about what you need to actually be training. In terms of rep range, I would say for most hinging movements, eight to 10 is a good range, but you could go six to eight as well, a little bit heavier. Uh, you could go a little bit higher. I mean, I've done 10 to 15, I've done 15 to 20 even, but I would say for most people, somewhere around 10 reps, maybe a little bit lower, somewhere in there is a good starting point. For curls, there's a lot more flexibility because there's no postural muscles involved. So I would say pretty much anywhere over eight reps is okay. I've done sets of 15, 20, 30, a huge range here works really, really well. Now in terms of volume, if there's any muscle group that responds better to sort of lower, more moderate amounts of sets per week, it's probably the hamstrings. They're exposed to a huge amount of mechanical tension, assuming you're doing the movement correctly. If you're doing Romanian deadlifts and you're not getting like fairly sore, especially if it's the first time you've done them, you're probably doing them wrong. And whenever I hear someone who's doing like a ton of sets for hamstrings per week, they're usually doing them wrong. They're usually drifting that tension into the quads, into the erectors, into the adductors, into their scapula, into lots of different areas. And they're not getting that full stretch on the hamstrings that is going to be fatiguing, but also extremely stimulatory, which means that you can't do that many sets per week. So I would say for most people, you want to get more out of less. So I would say eight to 10 sets per week is a good starting point, a mixture of hinges and curls. Curls generally you can tolerate more of, but they're less stimulatory. And then hinges done well are more stimulatory, but you also, you can't do as much. So um, I would say eight to 10 sets per week is a good starting point. Some people are gonna be a little bit higher. Some people are gonna be a little bit lower and you're just gonna to have to feel about what you can recover from and what lets you keep adding load to the bar.
And I don't think I've ever written more than three sets of RDLs in a single workout in a plan. If you can do more than three sets of RDLs, uh, I would look at the execution first. In terms of mind-muscle connection, you're probably not necessarily going to feel your hamstrings working during hinges. You should feel that nice stretch in the bottom position. But in terms of like a contraction, there's not really tension in that just standing position. Therefore, there's nothing to contract against and you might not feel that like burning sensation. Also, I know I'm going to be asked about squats. Squats don't really work the hamstrings to any appreciable degree. Even if you're sitting way, way, way back, you're doing like Instagram booty model squats. That's not a ton of hamstrings because it's lengthening at the hip, but it's slackening at the knee. Uh, and therefore, it's just not going to be training the hamstrings to any appreciable degree compared to a hinging type of movement. There is a continuum between quad dominant and hamstring dominant. I'll put a chart for my book somewhere on the screen here. But typically speaking, squats are not a very, very good hamstring movement. And I would say the main takeaways to hamstring training are going to be execution, especially on these big hinging movements. Sit the hips back, control the eccentric, pull yourself down with your hip flexors, get a big, deep, succulent stretch in that bottom position, feel your hamstrings ripping apart, and then push through your heels, standing up, feeling those hamstrings work. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little bit a little bit carried away there, a little bit flustered, but you really want to get the most out of the least weight on these and target the hamstrings as much as possible. But it's rare to see someone actually execute these movements well in the gym. Most people are just flinging around weight, they're using as much as they can, myself included. Again, I've been guilty of this in the past. And so maybe take a different mentality compared to just slap some weight on the bar. So I hope this has helped. Let me know if you have any questions down below, happy to help. Like, comment, subscribe, definitely grab a copy of my book for a lot more information on this topic as well as a bunch of other stuff. And I will see you in the next video. Peace.